Good evening to everybody and welcome to Trieste, the beautiful city you can see on my back. My name is Enrico Balli. I'm one of the local organizers of this ECSA conference 2020. Welcome to the conference, also on behalf of the University of Trieste, who couldn't take part to this opening this evening. It's a shame that you couldn't be together with us in Trieste physically tonight, but I hope that we uh, organize a, a nice program from you for you uh, to enjoy online. So let me introduce uh, uh, the chairman of our uh, association, Professor Johannes Vogel. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Enrico. And thank you, everybody, for joining in. Now, this is a really, really strange time. And somehow I feel that um, COVID has basically um, vindicated citizen science on so many levels um, that we can organize very rapidly, especially with the help of Enrico Trieste University and their teams. Such a fantastic hybrid conference shows the power of the digital, and that is what is driving citizen science in many aspects um, forward. So um, if you look at the challenges that are presented through the environmental crisis, through the health crisis, through the shift in economic um, fantasies um, we're having in the shift in education that we are seeing around the world now, driven by COVID. Um, these are all trends that have been already happening. They are now being accelerated. And I think citizen science will and has to play a huge part. And I think this conference will demonstrate how vibrant, how relevant, and how timely citizen science, how your engagement is for keeping the knowledge economy, keeping democracies going, and having a voice of experts and citizens in the necessary social and scientific change that we are seeing and that we all need to be part in. So thank you very much, everybody, for your hard work. Very sad that we can't meet um, here in Trieste, uh, but I'm sure we will. Uh, life will get a little bit back to normal next year. Now, <clears throat> Um, there is another big hybrid conference coming along, how citizen science is going to support the sustainable development goals. It will be uh, done under the auspice of the um, German presidency to the EU, 14th, 15th of October. We hope to see you all at that next hybrid conference in about a month's time. Um, so as you can see, citizen science is extremely vibrant it's alive, it's relevant, it's relevant through your work, <clears throat> through your work. So let's all continue striving forward, building a better future. Thank you very much for your engagement. And thank you again, Enrico, Trieste University and your teams for the fantastic work putting this on. Thank you very much. Have a fantastic conference. Thank you very much, Johannes. And now the second uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Riemann Schneider from uh, ECSA. Doctor, please on stage. Uh, Doctor, Dr. Uh, sorry, uh, we cannot hear you. There is a, may, may be some technical uh, problem from your side. Okay, so I guess we have some uh, technical uh, problem and uh, we couldn't uh, hear uh, doctor, unfortunately. 
And so uh, let me go to the next uh, speaker. We will try to uh, recover uh, Dorte afterward. And uh, so now on stage, please, uh, Claudia Goebel. Hello, my name is Claudia Goebel. I'm the co-chair of the working group on empowerment, inclusiveness and equity that we have at EXA and the Living Knowledge Network. We have worked with the conference committee in the past year to make this conference as open and inclusive as possible. One key measure we have for that is the safe space policy. And there is a team of dedicated people who will support us in the implementation. So please, if you become the target of, um, or if you witness unacceptable or harassing behavior, please report it. We post the link with all the necessary information in the chat. And please do not report any such behavior on social media of any kind. Thank you very much for doing this together. Bye. Thank you very much, Claudia. This is indeed uh, something uh, news for our conference. Uh, this is something uh, new for uh, most of the European conferences uh, I know. And I guess this is uh, quite a big of uh, this kind of uh, gatherings. So now let's try to see if uh, Dorte could fix uh, the technical problems uh, and we can have it into her talk. Uh, Dorte, please. Can, can you hear me now? Perfect. I think this is technical problems happening everywhere in uh, um, live and online, but uh, we solved this. Okay, so I will start again. Um, good evening, everyone, and thank you for being here. My name is Dorte Riemschneider, and I'm, on behalf of the European Citizen Science Association, I am pleased to welcome you this evening to the third European Citizen Science Conference. This BIA conference provides excellent opportunities to gain an overview of current topics and developments in the field of citizen science in Europe. I would like to thank all of those who, through their commitment to this conference, are supporting and strengthening the future of citizen science. And special thanks go to the dedicated members of the conference committee, Enrico Bali, Luigi Ceccaroni, Claudia Goebel, Muki Heckley, Susanne Hecker, Soledad Luna, Stefano Martellus, Francesca Rizzato, Andreas Forzi, and Dorina Stankulescu. Many thanks also to the program committee for putting together excellent contributions and to the entire EXAC team, including the interns Holly Woodward and Helen Ford, and especially to Tim Woods for the commitment. Special thanks to Cicia Media Lab and the University of Trieste the courageous hosts of this conference, who despite the difficult situation under the pandemic, were committed to the success of this conference. And last but not least, a big thank you to all of our sponsors for the generous support. With a special mention, of course, to our diamond sponsor, JCOM, who will kindly take care of publish publishing the conference proceedings. This year's conference theme, Encounters Incident Science, has become especially relevant during the current global pandemic. We are not meeting personally in Trieste in order to protect ourselves and others. In-person conversation, meeting with colleagues, spontaneous discussions after an interesting lecture, and the creative brainstorming of new ideas and projects during social gatherings is something we will all miss in the coming days. But at the same time, this conference is an experiment. We will explore digital networking, such as social lunches and the citizen science disco at the end of the conference. I would like to see this particular conference as a field of experimentation to develop hybrid formats for the future that could make face-to-face -face and virtual meetings simultaneously possible, allowing for participation by a global audience, as well as people who cannot or do not like to travel for various reasons such as family or climate change. In the last two years, there has been a wide range of new developments and achievements in the citizen science environment, in science of citizen science, in technological tools, 
in the variety of methods, in the quality of standards, as well as in the diversity of disciplines. Especially noteworthy is the creation of new infrastructure for the citizen science community in the form of the EU citizen science platform, which besides tools, training and materials also provides a space for exchange and networking. There's an urgent need to further promote citizen science, to advance and improve the decentralization of knowledge and knowledge production, to empower citizens and to conduct social discussions based on scientific findings. All available resources must be used to address local and global challenges, such as climate, biodiversity, health and society. Science and citizen science are always about society, citizens, people, their quality of life, their ideas and their expectations. In this spirit, I wish you an exciting and enjoyable conference, full of engaging encounters, lectures and discussions that will inspire your quest for knowledge and enrich the citizen science community for the years to come. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dorte. Very nice words. Uh, and uh, I think that this was a, a beautiful opening for uh, our conference. Uh, and uh, now I think that we should start with uh, our uh, special keynote, uh, a keynote that was not uh, part of the original uh, program uh, until uh, a few months ago. And uh, this, uh, this special keynote uh, <clears throat> is uh, just because uh, the time we're living now, the title of the keynote, as you know, is the citizen science in the times of COVID-19. COVID, uh, and uh, let me introduce the first two keynote uh, speakers, uh, Lucilo Tolini and Jérôme Tricomi. Please. Good night, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes. OK. okay that we can see you and hear you perfectly. So the first keynote uh, speech um, is uh, a lockdown to rediscover the double wall of non-formal education. Lucille is the first speaker. Yeah, thank you, Enrico. So my name is Lucille Tolini, and first of all, I'd like with my co-presenter, Jerome, so we'd like both to really thank the organizers for inviting us and helping us to think about something that we feel like really, really st still struggling with. <laughs> so you uh, you mentioned the name of our presentation, which I think I wish is uh, that you can read it on the, the presentation too. So the presentation tonight is a proposition to think about the corona changes on our organization. And if we succeed in our presentation, we'll go a bit further than the lockdown impact. So uh, we both from Les Petits Débrouillards, which is an international organization. And here's, here is some pictures of um, the work of the movement um, in different countries where you, you maybe are. Um, so we present in Canada, we present in Belgium, in Morocco, in Tunisia, in Algeria, and of course in France. Each of the national organizations of Les Petits Débrouillards have its specificity in the public to the which we dedicate our action to, the topics we focus on, or even the pedagogy and the didactic approach we use. So in France, we are, we are created in 1986. And there's around 50 local branches. Um, Jean and I belong to Northeast France one, once. And we're mainly known for our kids and youth interventions. Uh, geographically, our core interventions are situated in disadvantaged suburbs and rural zones, where there's either no science museum or a few offer of non-formal education for kids and youth. And sometimes both, no science museum, no, no non-formal education positions. Um, our topics of interventions focus on energetic transitions, social democratic transitions, 
and numeric transition in a manipulation and sensitive based pedagogy. Uh, so what you can hear down the slide is our, um, uh, our slogan, sorry, I, <laughs> I did not think about saying it, so I don't have the English word now. But anyway, um, on the bottom right picture, you can see this pink small bus, which is named Babette La Navette and which is uh, part of the project Le Science Tour that il quite well illustrates the, the work we lead in France. Uh, so it drives everywhere it's needed and uh, it can create very quickly a nice and visible space for kids, uh, for offering kids to kids and youth scientific activities. So tonight, Jérôme and I, We'll talk about. We'll talk to you about what we have done, even if it it was not planned to, during the lockdown, and how it changed our organization. Mainly the idea that we can make of our organization. Basically, in the fifteenth of March, we uh, had about twenty permanent employees, about a hundred non-permanent employees, mainly students. So who highly depended of this employment. Um, we had about 50 permanent volunteers under contract, mainly students too, dozens, but not very well counted number, number of volunteers and a large as well non counted number of supporters. And basically between the 15th of March, which was the date of the um, start of the lockdown in France, and the end of March, we had lost 60% of our activities calendars until the end of the year. We had lost 40% of our estimated budget, and we were not sure some state-based contract, contracts for permanent volunteers would be prolonged, um, even if they all highly rely on it. Not all our permanent volunteers uh, had personal laptops, Neither all of Les Petites Débrouillards members had the skills for home project making. So that, that was a time of um, very high uncertainty. And there was many fears for yeah, basically the organization and basically the action that we just daily do. We were just, yeah, we, we, we were totally lost, basically. Uh, but... March 18th, three days after the start of the lockdown, we organized our first virtual, virtual lockdown science coffee, as we called it. And it was about biology and coronavirology. And that was a big surprise because we basically, we do some science coffee every, every month in every pr local branches of Les Petits de Boya. And we welcome like 10 or maybe 20 people if it's very interesting or very in the trend. And so we had 60 people for the first one, uh, which was probably announced two days ago and organized by the same time, something like this. Um, so three days after the start of the lockdown, um, we had this first night event. And I don't know if you well remember this time, but it was not the time of all the webinar offer. It was pretty much nothing offered for um, at, at this at this time. And so yeah, so yeah, um, there was a big sorry, there was a surprise for the public that came, but as well for the scientists that very quickly answered that they wanted to come. Uh, and then we had a second event on, on the 21st of March, three days later, and three days later again, and three days later again. And they were all very um, successful in the number of the people that came. Uh, so which brings me to the end of the lockdown and the, the statement of what we had done. So we ha have organized 17 events. Uh, we welcomed over... 850 participants. We had 39 speakers, 16 talk show hosts. So it was a high time of science discussion and um, science contentions as well. 
Um, so I could speak of how much members and supporters needed to talk about science, to ask how much they, they needed to ask their own questions, how much they need to give their advice and talk about their own experiences, and not only to hear what scientists had to tell them. And probably some of the people that came to our events, they would not have um, um, yeah, they, they came there to, to get something else than what they could go from um, info uh, from uh, yeah, daily news. But I could speak as well of how much scientists were in need to feel immediately helpful to talk with people, to hear the wanderings and the contents of the people. But I will focus on yeah, some qualitative change for our organization. Basically, our volunteers um, made propositions for the topics for the, um, the scientist networks, the scientist invitation. Um, they, uh, yeah, our millennials members that are usually just um, in some execut um, um, yeah, executive positions, uh, their numeral skill, numerical skills gave them a totally new position in the organization which is not exec uh, executive anymore at all. Um, that changed, as this period changed as well, the consciousness of being a collective. It changed as well the place of, our of the organization in our home and families, because basically, yeah, Les Petits Débrouillards is just part of our yeah, night volunteering or for some daily job, but yeah, it just doesn't... <laughs> go uh, further. It changed as well our scientist networks. It changed. Uh, yeah, I mentioned our, uh, in the start of the presentation that we're part of an international mem uh, movement. And it was not for nothing because this um, yeah, lockdown organization just, tot tot uh, yeah, just totally uh, um, made this international uh, dimension. Um, yeah, each change for being something quite um, quite far away from for most of the members to something very yeah very visible and uh, uh, very important um, and I, I think that Jerome will say some words uh, on it after me um, so the lockdown period helped to remember as well that the publics and the beneficiaries of our action are not only youth and youngs but as well our activities organizers we were just isolated by this time that they could they were as well students back in their families or alone in town or isolated city rulers so as a conclusion for my first part <laughs> uh, the log Dance period and probably further than it, the corona period changed the idea of the organization the members uh, had on it. Um, and it, it can be perceived as a cultural or political change that is not important in the, in, in the daily life of this organization. But we figure out that it also changes the expectations expectations of the organization the members can have, uh, what they want to get of it individually and not only for the other, basically youth and kids before that, but also for, for them, them themselves. It changed as well the place members can hold and I think that John will say a few words on it and it changed responsibilities they can take out and it crucially saved our collective and our action. Uh, so yeah, for us now, I guess that the challenge is to maintain and to prolong some of those change changes, uh, but we can keep it for the discussion. Jérôme, I think it's your turn. So I'm on full screen, yeah. Okay, you here? Thank you very much. Um, so thank you to EXA and the team of uh, Media Lab. Uh, as Lucille said, and as she presented uh, already, so in our organization, uh, from the 15th of March, we had to make some drastic changes 
and to innovate and find new ways to keep our activities of scientific mediation and to do it online. I'm for myself an employee in this organization. I've been a project manager and coordinator since five years now. And so my point of view is rather practical. It's how we did it, what were the changes and the things that we noticed during this month. It has two goals. First, to reflect on how we found new solutions, but also I think that these months of lockdown and uh, the constraints on us can taught us, teach us lessons that we can use even when we are not in lockdown or in pandemic to have a more efficient uh, and closer to the people's scientific mediation. So next, please listen. So the first thing it was that everything was easier to organize. If you have organized events, you know how it is hard. You have to find a place, you have to invite, if you want to have some scientists, which like some curriculum, you have to invite them to find the place, to find the moment where everyone is free, then you have to communicate on your events. Well, everything was way easier. It was just like you call a few people you know that have a research project that is interesting and ask them if they are like available two days later. And yeah, that was way easier. So that was the first nice surprise. Next, please. So also what was really interesting was that we are a huge organization. In France, we have hundreds of members. And wait, I was in every big organization, it was really hard to know what everyone else was doing and also to know what resources they had in terms of social networks, people they knew that you could use for your own project. Uh, we decided to coordinate our digital efforts on a platform that is called Discord. If some of you are playing video games, they most probably know it. So it's a platform where uh, players team up to attain their in-game objectives. So we used this platform to coordinate all of our projects. We hosted almost 200 people daily on this chatting platform. And it made it a lot easier to use our of our collective resources to reach our goals. Next, please. So what was also interesting was that we had different participants in our online events. So these kind of concerns that we call science classes, these discussions with scientists about their research work and etc. Well, obviously, usually you have people from the same city and you have people that feel like they can come to this kind of event. So it always has been hard to reach young people, to reach working people, even to reach like young moms that can't just uh, get free uh, on the evening. And so that was the first nice surprise to have a different, a socially different um, pool of participants. And also, we had a lot of people coming from our international network. And that was also nice because, well, you organize an event for some people in France, and then you have our friends from North Africa, from Belgium, from Canada that come over and that can also enjoy the same conference. Next, please. So, uh, also, if you have ever led a discussion between uh, participants from the general public and scientists, you know that it is hard to get participants to interact. There are a lot of social bias that make it easier for some people to talk than others. And it is easier if you are 
older, if you are more well instructed, if you have knowledge of the question. And so even to feel legitimate and free to ask one's question is not something that is easy to obtain. You have still bias and you have still uh, some people with facilities when you are doing online events. But the specificities of the video conference tools that were used, the fact that you can have a debate on Zoom and live stream it on YouTube and use all of the comments and the chatting platforms to get the interaction deeper made it, well, the bias were different. For instance, young people that usually felt that it was hard for them to feel legitimate to ask questions or to address a matter or to express their opinions, felt more empowered to do so because they were on digital spaces that were familiar to them and where, for once, it was them who had the upper hand in being feeling in their space. So next, please listen. Lucille, can you push the, to the next slide? So I will wait for the slide, but I can go on already. So we have picked the positive in this experience, in these months of online debates with scientists, of online activities for kids. Obviously, there are some that there are some uh, elements that are negative. You can't reach a huge part of the population through digital events. You need to have a place to do so. You need to enter into communities. You need to address their expectations and questions. You need to define the nature and theme of your activity based on them. And well, to address some people, you need to be close to their homes. You need to go in the schools where the kids are, you cannot expect them to come over, even in a digital place. It's hard. So this is a limit of it. It's also a limit because obviously there are many people that have issues with the digital world and digital tools. So, and they were excluded too. So as a conclusion, and Lucille, can you please go to the next slide? And last, so we cannot really conclude because the lockdown is ended in France, but we have still social distancing and we can't organize the same events in the same way. So in some way, we are still in this period where we have to think and innovate every day. But as a conclusion, all you can say is that we have lessons to learn from the things that we had to do to keep our activities going during lockdown and during the times of COVID. And I think this is true for our organization, but I think that, and I hope that the thoughts that we put together for tonight can also help scientific mediation and citizen science as a whole to ask itself some questions and ask itself which lessons we can learn from these times, what we will keep, what we need to do better, what we won't keep, what were the limits also of this maybe enthusiast zone, but also excluding digital one. And well, Thank you for taking time to listen to us. And I heard from uh, the organizer that there is 
a Zoom room that will be uh, available later and that we can exchange them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lucille. Thank you very much, uh, Jerome. It was uh, a very nice uh, speech uh, indeed. I'm sure that uh, we will have the time to uh, discuss uh, after this session in our uh, Zoom room. And now let me introduce the next speakers. Uh, the second part of the session uh, is the Open COVID-19 Initiative, Lessons for Citizen Science and Beyond. And uh, it will be presented by Max Antolini and Thomas Landrian. The first speaker is uh, Thomas. Thomas, please on stage. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Awesome. Um, so first of all, um, on behalf of, uh, of Mark and, and myself, thank you again very much for inviting us for this conference. Um, it's going to be the first time that um, we present what we've been doing with Just One Giant Lab and the Open COVID-19 initiative on, uh, in public, uh, especially uh, after the COVID. And so we are especially uh, you know, excited to share with you uh, what has been happening on this side. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. There. Fantastic. Um, so I will be, we will be both be speaking. Uh, Mark will be uh, speaking later on, but I will start with a general introduction about Just One Giant Lab. Um, and so we, we, we mostly focus on trying to imagine what could be a framework, uh, an alternative to the traditional approach of science innovation that you can find either in institutions or in companies. Uh, and what I mean by that is if today you want to solve a problem uh, or study an object, you have two main paths. Uh, one is to go through academic institutions and there here you are motivated by either a career path or topic hotness uh, or through uh, a capital based innovation where your goal is to find a positive business model. Uh, but the thing is at the end, um, most of those paths, those two paths don't really you know, produce comments like open knowledge and technologies. Uh, you will find closed source knowledge and technologies through like paywalls or status based uh, access or patents and secrets. So the idea is how do we create um, a new approach uh, where at, at first of all, we are able to diversify the type of problems that we can study and, and problems to solve, but also uh, that can create even more commons. Uh, and so we think that the community-based uh, and contributive, co contributive approach of science innovation is the right way to go as it's based on collective needs. Um, and so that's the reason, main reason why we created Drogo. Uh, and so, you know, we, we live in a very special moment, not only because of the COVID, but because for the last 15 years, we've been, uh, you know, ramping up in the, in the, in the, our capacity to collaborate and communicate in the large scale sense to digital technologies. So we are in a new age for communities. Uh, and that changes pretty much a lot of things, but it's not only about digital communities. It's also about the fact that there is a lot of new ways to uh, build collaborations, build teams, build projects to have an impact around you. And through open laboratories, such as makerspaces, uh, hackerspaces, uh, and, and et cetera. And it's a, it's a huge network. This is just a network of fab labs around the world. So um, if you want to have access to a, to a lab space, uh, it's, it's become easier and easier, even though if you're not, if you're not a scientist. However, there is a lack of global collaboration, even within those open communities. Um, and so those, those open labs are very interesting for one thing is that it opened up who can participate in the process of the fabric of science. Now, uh, it's not about do you have a PhD or not uh, to, ex to express yourself on a specific problem. You can actually touch the prime that is just in front of yourself, you know, you can start uh, studying using the, the scientific methodology. You can share your uh, your observations with someone else. But the idea is, how do you create communities of skills and knowledge uh, in in those times? Um, and so, the point here is, uh, how do we uh, 
recover somehow missed potential. When you look at um, what current institutions allow as number of contributors to science, we are talking about 8 million, 10 million you know, uh, scientists. Uh, that's about a, a thousands of the, the, the world population. Uh, so it's, it's, really, it's really small, kind of, if you think about it, when the number of people in higher education is about a billion. So um, how, do, how can we recover that part? By, so, by, so by providing a framework that low uh, non-scientists really get into the fabric of science. Uh, and so here is another graph that is very interesting is um, if you're especially a young scientist, uh, it's 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 hard actually for you if you're below the age of thirty uh, to find a way for you to get access to uh, institutional funding. Uh, and so, if you, especially if you look at you know the, the area under the curve below the age of thirty five, it's 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 really becoming harder and harder with time, as you can see. Uh, and so, so the point is, we have a new generation uh, of scientists that are not going into academia anymore and are preferring the path, for example, through startups and companies. Uh, and uh, so, so, so here there is kind of a crisis for for human resources. So, we how how can we change? Uh, you know, how can we bring even more people to? The fabric of science. That's that's the main problem. So one of the 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 thing uh, we need to solve first is an accessibility issue because we have a lot of uh, people that are on the field working on different problems, such as researchers, entrepreneurs, civil servants, and activists. Uh, and but they lack usually either the resources or the skills. Sometimes you know the team, uh, the, the the collaborators, the contributors to really get to the point where they be able to implement their idea. And then on the other side, you have a lot of students looking for ways to uh, you know to, uh, to to just improve their skills or their knowledge and experience or their network. You have professionals who wants to help. You have patients who want to get involved and citizens in general, obviously. Um, so the idea is that how do we connect this? Um, and we have existing social networks uh, for science, but it's mostly for academics. So we had actually to, to make something happen for more, a global um, public, basically. Uh, so that's the reason why we created Just One Genet Lab. At the beginning, it's, which is an NGO based in Paris, it's a nonprofit and, and, and it's a digital platform. It's not a physical space. Uh, and so we, uh, we, we created this a year ago with Mark and, and Leo Blondel. Um, and just to, 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 to jump right in the subject of, of COVID-19, um, one thing we do with Jogo is to create open science and open research programs where we set up a theme and then we invite whoever wants to, to, to collaborate to build projects. Uh, and so Open COVID-19 was started about at, at, right at the very beginning uh, uh, of March, like on the 1st of March, I believe. And, and, and so at first the idea was um, there was a, not a lack of understanding or lack of uh, vaccines at the point or lack of masks. The point was, how do we have uh, a better understanding of what's the status of the of the of the epidemic? Uh, so we like we were lacking tests. So um, at first, the idea was, how can we? Um, uh, you know, collaborate together with a larger community of biohacker and scientists to build a low-cost, open-source uh, diagnosis test uh, for COVID-19. So that's how everything started. That was the, the, the birth of the community. Uh, but it grew much bigger with time as more people were coming in uh, over the platform and with more projects. And so we had actually to create new categories, not only for diagnostics, but also for prevention, for treatments, for, and, and, and for also fundamental research about, about, uh, about COVID. Um, and, uh, and so far, we have more than 120 uh, COVID-19 uh, related projects on the platform. Uh, and so it, it really grew uh, a lot. And the diversity is really fantastic. Um, I don't have much time actually to go into the details of the projects, but um, you know, besides the diagnosis test, we have uh, people working on, on engineering projects, such as for ventilators uh, or open source mass design. Everything that you know we do are um, scientific and technical common, so it's open source. Uh, we also have people working on uh, way to uh, to better, um, for example, 
um, share knowledge uh, and, and educate through workshops uh, and lessons that you can provide online. Uh, people are just looking at data, personal data, uh, to do statistics uh, um, about can we, you know, for example, discover if you have um, COVID or not based on the cough sound that you make, stuff like that. So it's, it's really, really large. Uh, I really encourage you actually to get and have a look at what's going on. Um, and, and so, um, the, the way it looks is that we have, it's, it's a big digital community, but composed of sub digital communities uh, of various skills and, and, and knowledge. And Mark will get more into details uh, and the analysis of those communities. But what's interesting is um, the community itself was not only involved in uh, helping the projects on the platform, uh, but also was part of the program itself and how it was run. Um, and for example, um, we put in place uh, a system of micro grants. One of the things that was really key for the projects to get uh, to the next step was that because they didn't have an official institution behind them because they were being created right away you know, uh, from in an ad hoc situation. So um, they couldn't access to normal resources or funding through a normal institutions. So we had to provide something because most of the teams were composed of people that didn't know each other. Um, so micro grants were a way to support those teams, uh, and and it's it's very small funding. It's up to three four thousand euros per project, and the way it works is um, all projects provide an open applications. It's visible on the Jogo platform by anyone, and then it's the community itself that review the projects using a, a digital form, and at the end we compute a score automatically out of those uh, reviews. Uh, and so if in uh, we have two main scores, one is for impact uh, and the other is for the feasibility. And it automatically, if a project is a, be, a beyond uh, the score of 3.5 over five for impact and feasibility, uh, the project is funded. So it's not even up to us, Jogo, to, to decide. So it, the, 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 the weight of the, of the, of the choice uh, and the review is on the community. So that was something that, that really worked very well. Um, and we funded more than 20 projects like that over four rounds. Um, and thanks to, um, to, to partners such as the AXA Research Fund or, or the IFD. Um, one thing that I wanted to share is uh, the advantages of a community-based approach here. Uh, it's really because we, we, um, we are able to um, and charge ourselves, you know, of some responsibilities that are normally, um, you know, belongs to to an institutions to run, such as monitoring, creating a framework of security of, of safety, you know, within a specific program. This was done by the community too. So we created the biosafety and biosecurity board, uh, composed of members of the community that were also experts in those uh, areas. Uh, and so we we we, we created uh, um, actually a, um, a list of, of good practices to have and ways to react if there was an accident or not, for example. Uh, we had community ambassadors that uh, also were going over and, and, and were available if there was any uh, situations uh, to deal with. Uh, the reviewing, as I was just explaining, uh, with an open peer, review, peer reviewing system. Um, and finally, the onboarding. You have to imagine that we're talking about a community of 4,000 4, plus members. Uh, and and it, was, it was at some point at the, at the heart of the crisis, we had more than 200 people arriving every day. So we had to onboard those people, explain them how, how it was working, where they could find actually a project that could be of interest to them, uh, et cetera. So, and this onboarding actually was done partly, hopefully, by the community, or we couldn't have done it, you know, alone, definitely. Um, just to give you an example of uh, the massive growth that happened just at, 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 with COVID. So Jogo, as I was saying, is just one year old. Uh, it was launched as a beta in la last summer, but we were mostly on the ground, you know, testing some features with a sub community of uh, less than 500 people. But then when the, the, the crisis happened, we said, okay, we created Jogo for such a crisis. We have actually to, you know, get out. And so 
um, we uh, we saw a massive growth uh, of servers <laughs> that broke three times, and uh, we had to adapt very fast. Um, here is a is a small animation of what happened, you know, in the in the course of a, of a few months. Uh, and so we saw a global community arriving uh, onto the platform and wanted to help. Uh, and so you can see it's mostly from Europe, North America, and India, even though we have some members from South America, Africa, and Southeast Asia too. Um, and uh, we have uh, a planetary reach, which is really, really, really amazing. Uh, we, we, we looked at the, at, the, at the data and the map, and uh, there was only uh, four or five countries that did not connect uh, to Jogo to Jogo platform, uh, and uh, and one of them was North Korea, obviously, uh, and and so um, we uh, we were really happy to see that, and it's going to uh, it's it's and, and the community is very strong, so it it you really have this 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 movement of of uh, helping each other, uh, and 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 so we've seen, for example, many projects fusing. Uh, and uh, so in a sense that th th the question is not about who is going to get first uh, you know, uh, a resource, it's about how can we get the best resource possible. So, so um, removing the ego part here somehow of, of, of what you can find in science usually uh, in institutions means that you can actually build stronger teams. Uh, it really works very well. Um, and um, so I'm going to uh, leave it here for myself, and I'm going to uh, uh, pass it on to Mark, who is going to get into more details about um, how the community dynamics uh, happened and what are also the learning there. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. I will I will share my screen as well, uh, and uh, this is this one. <clears throat> And indeed, uh, I think one can think of, of, of this uh, part as kind of a perspective of how when you have a platform and when you can actually design algorithm and you can look at data, <clears throat> you can think of, of engineering encounters. And I try to stick to the, <clears throat> to the theme of the conference here, which is encounters in citizen science, but in the context of Juggle, it was really a bit larger spectrum than citizen science. Uh, this is an example of the encounters in, in the open COVID case. And these were the interactions on uh, the uh, um, forum, like the Slack uh, that we had for the community. And what you see is that there was an organization with some subgroups, uh, you know, ventilators, cough detection, etc. Uh, but there, there's two things that you can see when you look at such a network of interaction. And the first thing is that uh, if, if the program worked or if there were so many people engaged is because you had a huge coordination. Uh, you had many people in the coordination team and many emergent coordinators from the community uh, who helped coordinating as, as Thomas said before. And the other things that you can see <clears throat> if you, oops, uh, there is, I don't know how to, I don't know how to remove this little uh, uh, thing that's there. Okay, and yes, I'm trying to remove that thing. Okay, uh, what you see is that at the <clears throat> uh, in the introduction, uh, uh, there is in the network also uh, a huge need for onboarding strategy uh, strategies to onboard people that are coming to this network but not yet embedded in this interaction network. Uh, and so it's really when we when we live through that really coordination cost in that moment of difficulty to manage such a huge initiative, it Mark, really can, I can click on hide if you, actually if you want. On high? Yeah, you see the on the little bar you have yeah, yeah. and it hides my okay, I see. Okay. Perfect. Does it work now? Do you see my screen? It's good now, yeah. Okay, it's good. Uh, <clears throat> sorry for that. Uh, so what's, uh, what, what it really reminded was uh, this, this sentence from Michael Nielsen in Reinventing Discovery, where he talks about the citizen initiatives that become very, very large and where it's not possible for anybody to actually know everything that's going on just because it's such a massive crowd. And he talked about something called the architecture of attention which would be a system designed 
to direct participants directly to places where their particular talents are best suited to take the next step. And that's really something we wanted to design with Juggle in the first place, uh, first place as a social network uh, was a way to engineer encounters. So to create a platform where you can design a recommender system that can connect people that didn't know that they could connect maybe on the same project, but because they have skill sets that correspond to their expectation, maybe they can form a team, or maybe they're working on similar projects. Uh, and so this is something we have uh, realized is was needed to really design, especially in the context of open COVID, where there was so much coordination needed. So it's, it's kind of a tool to facilitate coordination. We're not the first one to think of making a recommender system for open science or citizen science initiative. Uh, SciStarter designed a recommender system uh, for recommending projects to users. And when they started the uh, experiments of, of, of putting this recommender system in place, they really see a big jump in the amount of participation to the project. So it's something that we uh, got uh, funding from the Nesta Collective Intelligence Grant. Uh, and what we're doing is we're doing an experimental test of how we can uh, uh, match needs that people are talking about. For example, they need to develop tests uh, to users that could answer these needs because they have the right skills. So it's basically how you bridge from being somewhere as a user in the skill set to collaborating with someone else that is very, very far from you in terms of skill sets. And how do we automatize that? Uh, and so that's something we're uh, uh, designing now, where you're, the experimental test is that we're going to send recommended and featured needs by emails uh, to, um, to users. And we're going to measure how location, skills, and topic of the needs affect their engagement so that we can actually design the recommender system and the parameters in a way that maximizes uh, collaboration and engagement. It's something we're doing uh, with uh, uh, Pedro Morales from Sciences Po Media Lab in Paris and Bastian Sovaraz from Cree. Uh, and we're using a network science method for that that uh, allows to maximize diversity in a network of interacting agents, so interacting users, trying to maximize diversity and avoid echo chamber. And that's something that is also a step we really want to do compared to tra traditional recommender system that create echo chambers and bubbles is that here we actually want to do the opposite, which is to incentivize for interdisciplinary teams uh, and collaboration activity. Uh, and actually, if you're interested in that, you can go on YouTube. We've done several journal clubs around that theme that we've recorded uh, and put out there. Uh, and we're inviting people from different fields to actually give us insights about how to design such a recommender system so we have computer scientists, physicists, social scientists that uh, uh, showed us uh, some very nice, uh, uh, very nice talks. So I, I recommend you, you can check Juggle on, on YouTube. Uh, and finally, to design such a recommender system and to design these encounters, uh, we're also doing uh, a lot of research on how uh, teams form and collaborate to produce science how fields form, so how do you innovate in science, how open source communities form and manage themselves, and how people collaborate together uh, in horizontal collaborative learning uh, um, uh, trainings. And we're using data that is not from Juggle, but from other initiatives that have taken place to better understand what, what creates good collaboration. And that's something that is also supported by the Center for Research and Interdisciplinarity, uh, where uh, I have a research team looking at these uh, different uh, topics. I'm going to showcase one example, because this is an example of a competition that was an inspiration uh, in part for, for, for Juggle and for these initiatives, challenge-based initiatives to have engagement uh, uh, of, of students that are at very varied level of expertise, but that produce incredible projects. And so it's the iGEM competition, which is a synthetic biology competition. You can see all the teams behind here. And these teams are doing six months projects. They're doing biology projects. It's been uh, happening over more than 10 years, uh, and there's been many, many teams participating. 
And the good thing is that we have the uh, uh, outcome, the performance of these teams. And so we're using that, uh, and, and these teams have to uh, put data on, on uh, 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 they have to describe what they do on digital notebooks uh, on the web. And we've been using that as a test bed, as a model to understand uh, team interaction network inside teams, team collaboration networks between teams, but also how these teams reuse the work from other teams and how all these affect their success and their performance. So we've been using data-driven approach to model the performance of this, and this is something we're uh, using uh, in order to actually uh, design the parameters for the recommender systems. So this is one example, uh, and I, sorry, I, I won't dive into it too much, but we're using that as a, as a model system in a way, and it led us also to design tools to actually go in teams and understand how they're collaborating and how they're interacting. And that's an example, it's an app that we have designed that allows us to go uh, in a distributed manner, uh, send questionnaires and uh, to teams and allow them to, to, to use it as a diary where uh, it can allow to understand what, uh, uh, what they do and how they collaborate together. And we're using that as an instrument uh, um, to measure the collaboration potential in teams and to understand, you know, the dynamics uh, of these interactions. Uh, and that's an example of a team we can reconstruct from that. Uh, and so to give a perspective uh, and, and go back a bit on, on the uh, overall strategy uh, uh, for Juggle as well, uh, is that we're developing research that are basically data-driven methodologies to understand collaborative work. And these data-driven methodology are there to feed uh, the knowledge on how to design recommender systems. Uh, and in particular, recommender systems need careful design because they, because they can lead to echo chambers, and that's something we want to avoid. Uh, and finally, uh, I wanted to give a perspective that it's also of, of very strong interest for us to involve citizens in actually designing such tool uh, and also helping in uh, what is called monitoring the monitoring. If, if people begin to uh, monitor, uh, for example, sustainable development goals, how do we involve citizen science in monitoring that this monitoring is of quality, which brings us back to the open science, uh, open peer review systems that we have put in place. Uh, but this is uh, 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 kind of a, a strong perspective of that work. And I wanted also to say that this uh, research on citizen science, uh, it's also work that we're uh, uh, doing in the European project uh, called CROT for SDG, uh, and that I invite you tomorrow to come and, and uh, meet us at the lunch time uh, in the conference, uh, where we're going to discuss about how to implement this, this research on citizen science in the context of climate resilience. Voila. Uh, and thank Last you. Slide. And this is the last slide. So now I'm very happy to, uh, I don't know if there's a Q&A session. Tu peux partager la dernière slide? Yes. Uh, should I share uh, the last yeah, okay. slide? So thank you very much, Mark. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas. It was a really an exciting uh, talk. And uh, now let's move to our uh, events room on, uh, on Zoom. Uh, you should see uh, on um, on the window of me of Vimeo the URL. Just click on uh, the link, and we should be able to move uh, uh, to discuss with our keynote speakers uh, uh, for uh, one more uh, hour. So thank you very much to all the speakers, uh, and uh, see you in a few minutes on uh, Zoom. <laughs>